So, how to close a thousand websites and replace them with a Drupal platform? Um, yeah, as you can see, we're, we're quite a lot of people on stage, so it's going to be a bit uh, information heavy. So, um, I hope you had a good lunch and sit back and be prepared to be bombarded. Let's see. So, this session is for uh, LSD enthusiasts. That's large-scale Drupal, of course. Um, it's government, government Drupal types, and it's uh, for strategists and content strategists, um, and for anyone in between these groups. Just so we have a reading on you guys and, and what you're here for. Um, how many of you are interested in large-scale large Drupal? Okay, so that's more or less all of you. Okay. Uh, anyone from government sectors or something like a municipality? Yeah, so that's half our, of our colleagues. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and any strategists, content strategists among us? That's a few as well. Great. So, what's on the agenda? We'll, uh, we'll do a small presentation of uh, who we are uh, as individuals and, of course, as uh, the municipality of Copenhagen and, as well, a small uh, mention of pro-people. Then... Uh, why we're doing this, um, and how we did it. And we'll use some examples from our uh, current project, the, our big intranet. And then uh, finally, of course, we'll look a bit into the results. So, yeah, I'm the guy on the top left. Um, I work as a digital strategist. Uh, and I've been responsible for the intranet, and I'm working a lot with Drupal, and I've been doing it for almost three years now, I guess. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Kaya. Uh, I work also with the overall strategy for our platform, and today I will focus on the content strategy part that not so many of you are interested in, but I'll tell you anyway <laughs> why it's important. Uh, I've worked uh, with Drupal since Drupal 5, so I think that makes five or six years now. Please applaud the ladies. <laughs> Uh, hello there, my name is Rumen Yodonov, I'm uh, from ProPeople. I'm leading the Drupal operation in the Bulgarian office of ProPeople. I've been doing Drupal for five years now, and I'm intensively doing performance optimization infrastructures and basically creating a, a really crazy technical project. Thank you. Hello, I'm Yuri. I also work for Pro People, and I was involved on the technical part of the project. And uh, my area of expertise is services and communication between sites. And we're going to have we have a lot of them on this project, so that's where I was involved. So, a bit about. Uh, Copenhagen municipality. We might refer to it as KK a few times. It's a Danish abbreviation, so bear with us. Um, yeah, we are uh, 550,000 uh, inhabitants in the city. We've got, we're a green city, we've got 650,000 bicycles. Um, over the next 10 years, we, uh, we're guessing that we'll be around, or it's estimated that we'll be another 100,000 inhabitants in the city. Um, this is not only for Copenhagen, of course, but Danes are considered the happiest population in the world for the last three years running. Let's see how that keeps on going. Um, and that, despite the, the big tax rate, as most of you probably know about already. Um, and that's, of course, also interesting if you're working in Copenhagen and you notice that there'll be another 100,000 inhabitants. That's going to be some good projects. Um, in the, in the municipality, we've got around 40,000 uh, employees, depending on how you look at it. And they're organized into seven uh, distinct administrative branches. They each have their own mayor. I'll uh, show you a small chart later. So, here's where it gets interesting. This is our IT facts. We've got at least a plus a thousand websites in, in, uh, related to, to Copenhagen uh, City in 
one way or the other. Um, for those 1,000 sites, we've got at least 500 editors, maybe even more. Not everyone is registered. And um, considering we have 1,000 websites, we have uh, 500 editors, and we have a lot of hosting, of course, that means we have a web budget that we are estimating goes above at least 10 million euros per year. And on top of that, to make things even more uh, yeah, uh, confusing, there's 1,400 different IT systems. Among those, there's like 17 time logging systems, probably even more. We don't have the exact numbers on these. We've got 70 system, maintain system maintainers. Those are the guys that work with the systems on a day-to-day -day basis. And yeah, we've got XX IT budget. It's not even, it's, a, it's not an easy task to calculate this and we haven't done it. Um, and some of you will then say, so we're doing a big system, how can we actually derive some sort of business case from it? Well, oh, sorry, actually we, sorry. Just a quick, uh, we introduced this slide a bit late. This is pro people, of course. We have to mention them. They're uh, great guys, and they're the IT partner of our project. So yeah, why did we do it? As I just tried to mention, it wasn't because we have a big uh, business case for this. Um, I'll read this quote. It's good. Organizational anarchies are organizations characterized by problematic preferences, unclear technology, and fluid presentation. Such organizations can be viewed for some purposes as collections of choices looking for problems, issues and feelings looking for decisions situations in which they might be aired, solutions looking for issues to which there might be an answer, and decision makers looking for work. So yeah, this is the garbage can model and it sort of underlines that we didn't have this sort of distinct uh, reason for, for doing uh, the system if you look, look at it from a business perspective. This is one version. The second version is this one. We've got at least 250 sidecore sites. We've got um, 21 Drupal sites at the moment. Well, that's growing quite a lot, of course. We've got 11 Plone sites, 44 WordPress sites, at least 200 homegrown uh, unidentifiable systems. We don't even know what they're built on. <laughs> and then, yeah, the rest of the numbers are all the other systems, you know, so if there's, there's Synchron, there's uh, Dynamic Web, Yumna, SharePoint, Type 3, Oracle, I'm guessing if you can name it, it's in there somewhere. Yeah, and that's, of course, that translates into a hell of a CMS frenzy. Um, and for a big organization like ours, that's, that's more or less, uh, that's impossible to maintain. That's not only from a server perspective, that could be from a support perspective. Yeah, anything you can think of, it's complicated. And that, of course, translates into a huge overhead. Um, so we're overspending on <coughs> stuff we, we shouldn't be spending on. And it also, of course, if you look from a developer perspective, it means that we're doing the, the same integration to our Active Directory maybe a hundred times. That's expensive. So why we did, why we did it version three? Um, well, some of our sites are really old. This is our um, now, uh, now buried internet, or what remains of it. Um, as you can see, it's... Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's old. <laughs> so why did we do this in, uh, in actual fact of the summary? It was, of course, with this goal in mind that we wanted to, to enhance and improve our uh, a whole ecosystem of, 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 of WIP. That means we want better maintainability. We, of course, want reusability. We don't want to do the same thing again and again and again. Um, scalability, of course. We, we know we're we are going to expand. We need uh, bigger and bigger solutions for some things at least. Uh, we want to standardize stuff that makes it easier for us to support. Of course, quality. If we can put things on one platform instead of having a trillion sites, that means sites that mean that we can yeah we can make better quality. And yeah, of course, we're a political organization, so. If we can leverage any form of economy from scale, that's, of course, yeah, that's an obvious benefit. So, why Drupal? Um, you guys can probably give us uh, a lot of better reasons than, than these, but, but Drupal is a great system for what we're doing. Um, the, the major decision point in, 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 uh, in Copenhagen was actually 
if you look at it now, probably mostly that it's open source. Um, and of course that there's a big and a huge community, um, us, all of us here. Um, but it's, it's not a, a glorified sort of, okay, Drupal is better than everything else in this term. term. So, starting to build this platform, we, uh, we set about some mantras for ourselves. How can we do this the best way? Um, one is, yeah, close more websites and applications than deploying a new ones. Um, if you think about a thousand websites, you know there's going to be a lot of redundant and old and uh, useless information out there and we want to kill this off. We want to replace uh, three solutions with one solution that has better quality, basically. Second mantra, we want simple scalable structures instead of meeting specialized needs. This is of course quite difficult when we're working with uh, politicians and in political institutions. Um, scalability is not sexy uh, and so is structure. It, it, they're quite boring. Politicians want good magic. They want to see some fancy websites and they don't really care if there's any sort of reuse unless of course they get the obvious sort of question, do you care? Yeah, but they don't. So the final one. We wanted to use existing country modules and contribute patches instead of, of creating our own ecosystem of modules and functionality. This is uh, historically what we've done in a big organization like uh, Copenhagen. Um, we've used the image of a duck pond. Uh, for the Danes among you, you know what this means. This is sort of a Danish way of looking at the world, or not looking at the world, I, I should say. We're, instead of, um, instead of uh, taking part of a community, we have a tendency to maybe say, we are so big that we can do things ourselves. We wanted to try and, and kill off this uh, way of looking at, at, at IT and web, at least in, a, in the Drupal web department. Um, and of course, this also gives us some obvious benefits. So we're not uh, dependent on solely one, one uh, person in our organization who did one module 10 years ago or a specific vendor. Um, so we had some challenges, of course. Um, when we started this project two years ago, uh, one and a half years ago, there was no clear-cut strategy on web whatsoever. We still don't have a web browser strategy. So it, it's not a thing that just b builds itself. Uh, another challenge, we've chosen a system that needs, uh, that works best at least on a, a LAMP setup, had no LAMP setup uh, experience whatsoever. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we're a political organization. That means we've got seven distinct branches. They each have their own mayor, their own management, their own finance, their own uh, IT, and their own communication department, whatever you can think of, they have it internally. Um, and on top of that, or should we say across that, there's uh, corporate services where me and uh, Kaya and a few of the people here uh, are working. Um, we should try to be sort of politically independent, so, we, so our challenge is to sort of navigate this, these seven distinct political structures which have their own goals for what they want to do with IT. So, this famed platform that we're doing, what, what is that? Um, it's a, we want reusability, so it means we want to look at uh, user administration and access as, as a part of a platform. This is not something we want to reinvent and reinvent and do again and again and again. Same thing goes for UX, um, information architecture and design, of course. We don't need to start a new branding project each time we do a new website. Um, content strategy, we want to be able to share content. Of course, a code base. Let's not do another Active Directory integration again if we can avoid it. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, infrastructure. So. Um, to accomplish this, we try to set up a, a timeline for how, how we'll approach this, because there's a lot of things in there we need to solve when we're doing a platform. And as you can see, it, it, it goes on until sometime 2015, and it'll probably go on forever. Um, but the point of this being that, that we're a political organization where people want magic, they don't want to build a platform. So we have to finance our long-term goals, the platform, the, the platform strategy, from the individual projects. Um, so if you, if you take a look at the chunk between 13 and 14, you can see that we're doing KK Intra, that's our internet. We're doing some self-service, uh, internal self-service programs. 
uh, a my page or page to see some basic user information for you as an employee, uh, our directory, and, and a few other things. And that then, if we go down to the, the bottom half of our platform, it translates into some solutions that we can reuse for, for new, new projects. So we, at, at, at this point in time, we now have our, um, we have our first LAMP stacks. We have a lot of LAMP stacks now. We've, we've got a, a taxonomy server. We've got Solar running. Um, we've uh, started Drupalizing our internal developers. Um, we've, got, we've communicated about this Drupal platform. That's a big challenge in, a, in an organization like ours to sort of convince people to go this one way. So, yeah. To exemplify some of the things on this platform, um, We've, we, we want to look at, at, at our internet project because this, this, this took, made the first sort of big uh, impact into getting this platform done. Um, a major point, of course, being let's avoid early mistakes. We've got a long road ahead of us. Let's not try and fix everything all at once. Then we'll set ourselves up for failure. That's, that's a given. Um, then we wanted to look at content strategy and scalable information architecture, which uh, Kaya will uh, look into in a second, um, and uh, after that, or along with that, that was probably the right term for it, we'll uh, look into infrastructure and implementation, uh, which Roman and uh, Yuri will uh, look into, and then prepare for the future. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we think about content and content uh, strategy as an important element in a platform strategy, as an as a unmissable element in a platform strategy. And uh, we have this, uh, one of the first things I want to show you is this model, and it's, uh, it might be a little hard to see it from afar, so I'll explain what it means. Uh, it's a matrix of all the content channels that we are trying to uh, incorporate into the into the platform. It's, it's a matrix of the 1,000 sites that exist, and the probably, hopefully, only 300 that will exist in the future. So what, what the axes mean are, on the vertical side, on the vertical one means there is broad websites, that means they have broad target audiences, they have a lot of content, they have broad goals, and on the other end is focused and spe specific websites with uh, more either a more narrow, narrow uh, target aud audience or a very narrow theme focus. Uh, on the other axis is, uh, in one end, the internally directed websites. Those are directed at uh, employees. And, uh, and on the right side is externally citizen-directed uh, websites. So to give a few examples of what's inside that ma matrix is uh, on a very broad uh, portal-like website Directed at citizens is our main uh, portal for, this, for the municipality where citizens go to find service and, and um, business goes to find service and information. Uh, and as examples of, uh, of more focused websites would be uh, institutions like kindergarten websites, campaigns like uh, bike mall in the city, uh, or specialized long-term uh, websites like uh, open data websites or uh, uh, websites uh, telling you about parking in Copenhagen or whatever. Spe specialized uh, narrow focus. Um, on, on the internally directed um, uh, websites that are uh, sort of uh, focused would be uh, online employee magazines, institutions with login for citizens like for parents, uh, and uh, specialized uh, small websites for small units of uh, of the employees, and on the and on the broad side, uh, employee directed is our internet project. Obviously, it's uh, it's um, it's not one website. That's important to mention. It's I think now 13 websites, because we have this uh, decentralized structure of administrations. Uh, we we did, we we ended up deciding it was better to have. Uh, a number of websites, so there would be a certain independence to each of the administrations. Yeah. So the goals of, uh, of looking at content would be for us to focus time and resources for editors. Because with the mess of websites we had now, editors had to learn a lot of CMSs. 
They had to log in maybe somewhere between two and 15 places to edit content. There was a lot of duplicate content around. So we wanted to get rid of that by enhancing more sharing and reusing of content, by making it possible to publish too many channels, by having a coherent UI for editors to separate form and content. I'll show you why in a second and to make this work across the platform, which means across the, the landscape of websites that we plan to have. This is our starting point uh, for uh, solving these problems, the, the internet that we have now replaced. It's, uh, it was basically two content types, articles and news. It had a very uh, advanced, uh, well not advanced, but a Visivik editor with a lot of freedom and tables to do the layouts. So uh, every uh, page would look different. Like this is another example, and this is another example, and it's things that we want to avoid in the future. So our approaches were these. First was uh, structured content. I think that probably everyone here knows why it's important uh, and has heard this song a lot. We worked with it in this way that we uh, learned ourselves how to love spreadsheets. And this is an example of one of the spreadsheets that we are now using to structure content for content types, for views of the content types, for, um, for uh, node queues, et cetera, et cetera. It's a, it's a fork of, uh, of a spreadsheet that Larry Garfield has uh, proposed. I can post a link on the, on the session site if anyone's interested. Um, so the consequence of working with that uh, structured content is that for most editors, this is what they will see mainly. Uh, the node edit forms with a very minimal Visivik. But some editors will not, will have like coordinating editors on, on uh, some websites. They will need to be able to assemble pages in a more advanced way. Um, so we have chosen a strategy where we have uh, tried to find a somewhat clear cut assembly model, which is based on panels and the panels in place editor. Where editors are able to assemble views uh, and they can also put in uh, more custom content which we base on fieldable panel panes so that, uh, so that they're still st structurable and we can find them for other views later, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a, an approach that's very much inspired by this distribution called Panoply that we like very much, but we have our own version of it which is a little bit um, simpler, uh, we think. This is, uh, this is what the editors see when they assemble pages. Uh, I think that everybody knows that if you don't put restrictions to the, to the amount of panes that editors can use, the system and the modules you use will, uh, will output, I, I don't know, 200 plus panes that can be used and it's very confusing. So we've, we've uh, narrowed it down to the ones that actually editors need to use. Uh, the fourth approach we had was to support uh, in our internet project uh, models of sharing and reusing content. This is one first attempt of that, which is the, the option for editors to publish news, important news across these 13 uh, internet sites. So news that's important to more than one administration uh, can be published without, uh, without having to copy and republish, etc. <coughs> This is another um, exploration we've done uh, into uh, reusing and sharing content. It's a, it's a pull. Uh, the first one was sort of a push model. You can push content out. This is a pull model. You can import. This is a search result where uh, editors can use the import button, the blue one in the middle, to import content from other websites. And, and the main fields of that content, those content types will be synced when it's edited on the, on the mother side, the first side or some. So the fifth approach we had was to learn uh, uh, editors to love taxonomies, which is uh, if anyone's done what uh, we're working on, moving editors from a, a hierarchy-based uh, CMS um, and into a taxonomy-based uh, CMS, something that's very hard, editors always ask, but what's the use of this? Why do I have to use all these taxonomies? So we developed, well, Ruman developed this very nice uh, uh, pane that lets editors um, assemble views 
it's, uh, for me, it was sort of inspired by what was called simple views in Drupal 6, that you scrape off all the unnecessary, very technical, difficult uh, configurations in views, and you make a, a, a very simple way of assembling views. They can, uh, they can choose content types and taxonomies, and, uh, and, and they love it. <laughs> It, it, it was a surprise to us too, but they really like it and they say things like, I understand now why I have to use taxonomies. How am I doing on time? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so uh, next phase, lessons learned from this content uh, work. Uh, the first lesson learned is that we need to extend the number of specialized content types. We have now, I think, around 10. Uh, but we need to, uh, to extend it with even more uh, because if we, uh, if we need the editors to not edit too much in the VC week, we need to give them options to, sh to display and show con uh, content of very different types. So that's one. Uh, and what we specifically learned from the internet was that we were, we were, we hated tables <laughs> because we didn't want the editors to, to do layouts and tables in the VC week. But we didn't actually see that they used tables also for sensible things, like uh, custom lists of who to contact and what newspapers were around for specific uh, uh, targets. So that's just one example. Uh, another lesson we learned is uh, that uh, even simple uh, assembly models like panels uh, with uh, the in-place editor and very narrowed uh, focus can be misused. I'll show you an example. Creatively. I'll give him, it's creative. But he, but he um, you can see in the right column, do are here, it means you are here. And it's an editor who used the, used the, uh, the in-place editor to create a fake breadcrumb. <laughs> because he, he missed it so much, the hierarchy of his old site. So he, he, he did that and that confuses a lot the, the, the user experience. Well, it's creative, I'll give him that. Uh, next steps, build more specialized content types, integrate more content from other systems. We have the 1400, and there is definitely around 50 that could be relevant to display information from. Uh, expand content sharing and publishing options. We're working on, on, on learning from those first attempts and making them better. And build best practice guideline, guidelines for content uh, editors. I have time for this, so I should yes, skip it. Yes. So the second uh, thing I wanted to talk about besides content was just a few points about how we try to do a scalable information architecture on the platform. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to avoid was hierarchies uh, because they're not scalable. Uh, for a large organization with uh, 40,000 employees and 1,000 plus units underneath, a hierarchy, it does evolve into this uh, like churchyard of old mis mishandled content that nobody looks at that's in the 10th level somewhere in the hierarchy. So we wanted to avoid that. Um, we wanted instead to learn the editors to think about their site as many sites and not one site. Um, if we have a thousand units, uh, they cannot all be sort of put into one site. We have to create a sub-site thinking. Um, the third thing is that information architecture uh, is not going to solve your organizational, political, and economical problems. So uh, we try to narrow down the amount of uh, menu items, uh, which is hard because everybody wants to be in the main menu. <laughs> and, uh, and in a political organization, politicians make really interesting uh, choices about what to put in the main menu. Um, so so uh, we, we try to, to uh, repeat that point a lot. And then uh, we wanted to uh, connect these 13 plus uh, internal sites through a global menu and we're working on that now. I'll show you. This is, um, this is the main architecture for the, um, for the internet. It has only two menu levels. The first one is the, is the black one. It has a sub level, so those are the two levels. And this is the next one you see underneath, the black one with the purple, is one of our, I think, very nice successes is that we made it possible to keep the overall administrative uh, menu 
in Fogos, but also have a local menu for the specific unit that you work in. So this is an example of a center uh, for uh, competency development. And they have their own site inside the site. They can go for the common information in the top still. Um, and the last uh, point, oh, I skipped one. How do they find the units uh, uh, from, from the main uh, front page? Uh, we developed this very little thingy that you can put on panel pages where you can, it auto-suggests your unit uh, so you can go directly from the main site to there. And this is uh, our next step. Uh, it is uh, combining all the employee directed websites with one common big global menu which is the black one in the top and the blue one in the right side is all your personal things so those are I think six or seven websites we have that are ha that contain personalized information and and those will be always available to you so we will develop this as a as a sort of service that provides the information based on who you are so it generates the menu based on who you are and what roles you have in, uh, in the organization. And, and it, it can be plugged into all the websites. So that's nice. Uh, and that's also the end of uh, what I'm going to talk about. I'll let women continue with all the infrastructure that makes this possible. Hi. I'm glad that you're still focused. And I'd like to start with what we actually want to say. Because so far we are bombarding, bombarding with a lot of facts. But for me, the message is very important. And when we make the presentation, we try to say, OK, but we should repeat our message. It does not work that well. <laughs> uh, why we are here? We are here to encourage you to adopt Jupo in a large organization. And we are here to encourage you to do it and to show you how we did it, because we consider this as a great success. And it's possible because of you guys. It's possible because of the community. Because the community is the most valuable feature in the system. I'll show later on, but we use community and we give, gave back to the community after this project. But having the community will give you a power that no other system available can actually do it. So please feel encouraged and I really hope that after the session you go and say, yes, the big project can be done in Jupiter and it's fun and it's a great thing. Okay, okay now, now for the boring stuff. <laughs> Infrastructure, as you see, in an organization that have not been adopted the LAMP stack so far, the infrastructure was really tough thing. And basically, what is infra IT infrastructure? The IT infrastructure is combination of hardware, software, services, and rules that ensure smooth operation. The creating a really solid environment is much more harder task than just creating uh, a bunch of websites. And basically, it's where it succeeded or failed. So let's start by defining the requirements for the municipality of Copenhagen infrastructure. They needed a self-hosted solution because of data security, because of uh, wall regulation. They need to host it themselves. But this also gives them a benefit to be very flexible in extending the solution because they are public organization. As public organization, any extent or new services requires a tender. And having the infrastructure inside will give them flexibility to extend the infrastructure much easily and skipping a lot of procedures. Of course, they use quite a different systems, as you've seen. So you need to create an infrastructure for the vendors to start developing and integrating inside their environment. So basically, when you have a new vendor, he should receive a box where he can actually start playing immediately and do the integration. They have a, a very little experience 
So controlling the websites should be very easy. They should have a user interface that it's very easy to maintain and uh, give them an overview of number of websites running, number of platforms running, number of servers running, and it should be relatively easy for them to actually create a new website, delete a website, put a site in maintenance. Of course, a system at that scale should be scalable, which means that you should be able to add more hardware and face the new demands. So you should not uh, create an architecture that depends on a single unit of failure uh, that you basically can scale afterwards. And it should be as easier for maintenance as possible. Again, if you do a great product but make them hard for maintenance, it will be a failure anyway because the people will face problems. We know that system fails, and if it's not easy, if you don't have the procedures, if you don't have uh, everything in place that will make your life easier, then the project will be a disaster. And last but not least, we meant this to be reusable. And it's not like reusable in a single vendor context. We, we, we hope that we are creating things that other vendor can actually reuse. And we even try to push to the limit so when people start developing things, they, they start thinking of sharing in the beginning. Because it's, it's, it's much easier to start to create something small and very custom that nobody can use. But if you are forced to think global and to think about usability of your code, then you start making the things that actually people can use. Of course, we didn't reinvent the wheel. We use the best practices that are already available. We are using virtual machines. Uh, we are using predefined configuration store in Puppet. Uh, we automated the pr procedure of creating new servers. So basically, as the system administrator in municipality states, a new server can be born in a split of a second. Uh, of course, we establish a development box for each developer, so when, whenever a new vendor comes into the organization and needs to start developing something, he immediately receives an account for the environment and he receives a virtual box machine where he has the full lamp tank ready and he's able to do all the integration that he cannot access without having this virtual machine. We have also established the, the what I call the infrastructure strategy, which means deployment procedures, failover procedures, and all the documentation, because when creating something very big, you need to document, you need to say, okay, if this is happening, you should do this. And in a large-scale organization, this is, this is one of the most important things. If you don't have a clear regulation of what should be done in different situations, then it, it will be a very difficult, because there are too many people involved. Another thing that a lot of people miss is optimizing when you're doing software. People are saying, okay, give me a metric. What is the expected world? So I don't need to care about the cache, the world is low. And, and, and this is a completely wrong statement to me. We should, and we are trying to prop people to start performance thinking since the beginning. So if a content is cacheable, even though all the users are logged in, why not cache them? Why not put them in Varnish? They are technologies. So you should not be like, OK, it's logged in content. Drupal does not support cache for logged in content. And we don't care. You should think about the performance. Otherwise, at some place, especially if the project is successful, you have a lot of problems. So we did all this work in the beginning to document the approach, and we decided also to verify this one. Because the infrastructure is, is a really serious matter, and we did everything, we have the knowledge, but we decided, okay, it's a costly thing, and we should verify it. So we invited our partner, Acura, to have a workshop with the customer and go through all the documentation we have made to all the plans, so to be sure that the infrastructure we are going to implement is actually uh, without any mistakes. And the workshop went very well, and I think that we've proven that what we have thinking is actually something that will work. We try to make the maintenance as easy as possible. Of course, 
I'm, I'm really saying we, because I consider that we, as a customer and quiet, we work together. So we put a lot of effort in, in, in like having the same and share the same goal, communicating the same things and trying to work together to, to make the things as good as possible. So whenever it's possible, we, we put fail over. On the places where we, it's not possible, we, we make it easy. We make the procedures what should happen if a server fails. Uh, we also establish a well-known deployment strategy. We have a development box for each developer. We have a staging server where a developer can actually deploy something and show it to uh, the inside organization. Once it's approved, let's say we have a new feature and it is approved, then it's actually the KK that have the ownership and they can move the code from staging to pre-prod environment. The pre-prod environment is complete replica of the production environment, so it has completely the same setup and you can run a stress test there and prove that, okay, the system will work good and then you move it to production and this is completely managed by interface. So, how we try to push and solve the problem with uh, reusability of the code. Solutions are pretty obvious, but we say, okay, we need to create one place for all the developers, for all the vendors, where they can actually see their work. We choose uh, Git, GitHub for it as a user interface, but we also push it to start thinking not of a website, but starting of creating actually a Drupal profile. Of course, we have, it's a natural thing because we need to create a factory that you create a lot of websites, but actually we start considering every project as a web factory. So instead of just creating and deploying, deploying a single websites, we focus more on having a Drupal profile. And a Drupal profile is something that is very easy for another developer to start to read. They say, okay, they're using this and this and this module. And I can go to the this and this and this module repository and see the readme, see what actually this module is for. And we enforce that a custom module have their own repositories. Because if you like combine everything into one repository, people start thinking of the components as part of the whole. But if you enforce and say, okay, but this module should live outside, they start thinking, okay, how I can actually make it so it, it works in other environment also. About the interface we choose, of course, we choose something that exists. It's open source and it's completely nautic. <laughs> the A gear is uh, uh, in a nautic mytholo mythology, god of oceans. And if Jubo is a uh, drop of water, of course, the ocean is the biggest holder <laughs> for Jubo. But why we choose A gear beside the name? It may actually matches all the requirements. It's open source, there is a community behind it. There are like 40 plus modules developed for iGear and it's very easy for us to extend it. What we have created so far and what is running on iGear, we have a distribution that we call KK Internet Factory. We have now currently 12 instances that runs these distributions. We have one distribution that manages and works as a central file manager. So the editors from all these instances will be able to actually share files and use them. We have one instance that is a taxonomy server uh, for all instances that they can share a taxonomy, which is a very useful thing for searches, for global searches inside the system because it gives you the same categorization for the content. So it's really good for making searches. We also have a very specific distribution. It's called KK MyPage. That is actually a personalized place for the employees 
inside municipality where they can see a personal details like uh, what's my salary, how many vacation days I have left, uh, when was my last promotion, did I get promoted at all, and stuff like this. So I'll just outline very fast some of the main features of the KK factory. Uh, it has full LDAP support, uh, including SSO, which means that if an employee is logged in into the domain on the computer, it's automatically logged in on the website. Uh, it has both push and pull content sharing, which means that an editor of a website can choose that this news or article is important, and he can choose on which other websites it can be available. And we have the other mechanism where actually the editor can use a search, find an interesting article, and create a local copy on it. We have, and we are using Apache Solar for searches. So we have one Apache Solar instance that index all the websites, and it's easy to search across them all. And of course, we have a responsive team. We have created one base team that is supposed to be used for all municipality projects and two sub-teams. And now I'm, we are going to talk a bit about the migration thing and the services, and I'll invite my colleague, Yuri. Hi. Well, if you might notice, for such a huge project, we can speak like whole day about technical details, but it's not the main aim of this presentation, so I will try to be fast. And because we needed to migrate so many sites, all of them are in different systems, but uh, the key solution we have gone through is the feeds module, so we build our solution around it. And uh, at the moment, we have a lot of content types, and I will go through like basic high-level way we do migration. So for each website that we need to migrate, we spin up the site in Drupal infrastructure. And uh, then we export all the content from the site we are migrating from. And it can be a huge gigabyte file somewhere with a lot of XML files in it. And in the new site, we just point out where that huge archive is. And then we pull that file unpack it, and with feeds, with feeds tamper and XPaths, we just go through those XML files and pull all the content in. And uh, that has a lot of advantages because it's, it has UI, so theoretically it's possible for even content editors to do that, but of course we involve more technical people in that process. And uh, it works pretty well, and we can possibility to roll back, so we use features a lot on this process. So, some statistics, a lot of nodes, terms, files, sites. And um, another important thing I want to talk about is the infrastructure about the services, because we had to make the sites communicating with each other. We, as Roman told, that we have special site that is file storage, like central one, and we have taxonomy. And when the sites communicate with each other, they use services a lot. And uh, okay, for the services, um, for example, I can give you some scenarios. If um, I upload a file and I want it to be shared between all the sites, I will need to tag it so it's shared, and then these files gets pushed to the file storage, and everyone on the other sites, they can search in the files that are in file storages, and they can say like, oh yes, I want to use that file, and it will be pulled. The same things comes with the content, so when I upload some content on my local site, uh, it got indexed by Apache Solar, and all other sites have access to the same Solar instance, so they can see like, oh, there's new content there, and if they build some like blocks with lists, they will see that content appearing there. But if they click, they will go to original site. But the idea is also that in terms of sharing, I can say like, oh, I don't want just the title of that nice article. I want, if it's like breaking news or something, I want it to be local. So I can go to that article, and I can download it to my local site. So we have done a lot of fancy, stuff in terms of services, and 
it proved to be a very nice solution and it's extensible and we have a lot of experience in that area as well. And thanks. So we were really fast to the technical solution because we don't have much time. It's uh, difficult to explain six month project in 60 minutes. But uh, we are going to post a uh, Drupal case on Drupal.org by the end of the, the week. And also you can uh, always join the Pro People booth and start asking questions. The people will be more than grateful to answering you. And I'll be really fast now, just going fast to the, actually the, the effort made. We've been doing the project for six months. We use more than 10,000 man hours. We use 200 hours in Scrum meetings. Uh, we implemented 2,700 features and there was a small amount of people involved, as you can see, 150, and I'd like to thank them all. <laughs> the result for Drupal, we have created 70 custom modules, uh, 103 features. We have contributed 58 patches back to Drupal. We have reported 44 issues. We have contributed one module. And we have actually used 200 contributed modules. So this is why I emphasize that the project is because of community. We also created one base and two sub-teams. The results for KK, we have managed to close 50 websites. We created 15 new websites. We have created four Drupal profiles and we hope that this is just the beginning of a very good friendship. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll invite Kaya now. Yeah, so before questions, I'll sum up real quickly what we think is the main themes of doing a successful platform. One is to have connectivity, so it needs to be easy to plug into. And this, I think, is one of the main benefits that we have seen in Drupal is that it is easy for other systems and other data models to plug into in a meaningful way that we can work with it afterwards. The second point is that for a platform of this size, you need anchorage and attraction. So you need to make sure to involve users, involve decision makers, involve editors in what they need. This is why we emphasize a lot uh, the content strategy because it makes the bridge between the infrastructure and the business needs. And the third thing is that we need to uh, create value and we try to do this in our, in our business model inside the organization. So it's, uh, you get a lot <laughs> from, from this uh, site factory that you can't get outside of the municipality. We're cheaper now and, uh, and, and, we, and we give more than a standard system would give to the to, to the editors and the, and the IT managers around the organization. That's what we think we're doing. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you're very welcome to ask them now. You can start. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I noticed in your in your numbers, I think it was 58 custom modules that you wrote, and that turned into and one contrib. Is that right? Uh, yeah, we have 58 patches, and and yeah. uh, we have contributed one module. Yes. Uh, um, I just saw that there were a lot of custom modules that you created. 70. 70. Yeah. Um, and I'm. I'm curious about that ratio. I'm uh, fairly new to the Drupal, uh, to the whole Drupal scene, and my understanding was that a lot of the work that uh, the developers were doing was done as sort of a part of a community project, and good idea, you know, good work would be reusable and wouldn't be wasted. And so, um, maybe I'm a little surprised that out of 70 uh, custom uh, modules, only one was contributed back to the community. And my question is, for the other 69 custom modules, was there not uh, a contributed module that someone else could have, uh, uh, might have written before that you could have re reused? Yeah, uh, this is a good question, but actually there are quite uh, a lot of integration for proprietary systems that only exist in this environment, so it does not make sense to be contributed back 
basically. And also a lot of the custom modules are just configuration over a stack of contributed modules that cannot be unfortunately exported in features. Yeah, you. Well, just a question about this process of, of kind of uh, uh, going from a, a lot of separate uh, websites to one sort of federated structure. Did you have a lot, a lot of fights along the way where you sort of had to uh, s maybe upset local editors and, and how did you g g uh, do that or did it all go smoothly for you? <laughs> Sm smoothly is, is probably putting it uh, a, a, a bit too, uh, too optimistic. Um, there hasn't been any sort of real uh, angry fights of, of people not, not seeing the benefit of this. If you line out that we have a thousand websites on so many different systems, it is quite ap uh, apparent that, that this is a problem for us. So in that sense, there's, there's good, um, th there's good uh, backing for, for this project in, in, in the whole uh, city state. Um, or city state, <laughs> the whole city. Um, but of course there is, when, when, when we get a bit above this sort of platform strategy, what we're offering in the, each of the different um, administrations, then all the specialized needs uh, arise and then that's where we hit the sort of the real fights because then one for Valding's way of, of talking about uh, IT might be completely different from another of these. Uh, uh, yeah, so there are fights, but it's uh, it's at a at a specialized level and not a, at the low level where we are sort of where everyone sees the benefit. Hi, I'm curious about how you're sharing taxonomy. So, um, so it looks like you have a central manager for, for you know, holding uh, an authoritative source. Yeah. Can can people push and pull taxonomy, or is it just kind of this is the one taxonomy? Um, and then the second question is actually how do how does each site get a hold of that taxonomy and use it? Woman, you can answer this. Yes. Uh, so we have a centralized distribution that people can actually log in and create taxonomy. Uh, it's like a control environment, so it's not like everyone create terms there. It's just uh, a, an editor that knows what they're doing, actually. And this is distributed to all the instances of the KK site factory. The websites are basically pulling terms, but each site factory has like uh, taxonomies that are global. They're taken from this centralized location and a local where actually the editor can decide to exchange the data and put their local terms. Okay, just to follow up then. So the actual pulling of the taxonomy terms, is that through services? Is that how you're doing that? Yes. Okay, thanks. Any more? We have a... Uh, yeah. I have a question. And I would like to know, do you always update the modules when there is a new release? or just uh, keep the website uh, after you finish it? It's, uh, when you're talking about the contrib modules, uh, we have two update phases. If it's a security updates, they're usually not breaking the consistency of the module, then we do the upgrade uh, immediately. Uh, and if we do have like uh, core contrib modules like C2, Spinos, that like uh, have a completely new release, that they are changing the number, like uh, putting a totally new version, then we are very careful in releasing these modules because most probably they won't work in the same environment, so we need to have a procedure by testing the environment, see that it, it's working, then we upgrade the module. Uh, for example, the Panoply is a distribution of the profile, and like one or two modules have new release, maybe for security issues, uh, do you update the whole Panoply? Yeah, we, we are actually not using the Panoply. We're using some of the concept and some of the modules, but we're not using the distribution itself. We are like uh, creating the things. Uh, again, through contrib modules, but we are using a bit different approach, but we are not using Panoply. Uh, Panoply and one-to-one. -one. Okay, thank you. So thank I think we're running short. We've already run short on time, so. Um, one more question, let's. Yeah, one, one <laughs> question and keep it short. <laughs> Oh, I had two now, I have to choose one. <laughs> you can pick one. <laughs> okay. Um, I was uh, curious to know how you managed sort of synchronization and management of uh, your code base, um, running multiple instances of the Drupal code base across multiple machines. 
um, the, we're using a, uh, with our multi-site uh, solution, we're doing a cloud-based thing with a single code base, um, and it's a little, it seemed easier for us to manage, and I, I'm wondering whether uh, there are obvious advantages to doing it your way too that we haven't considered. Well, we are using A gear for the purpose. Uh, the only difference is that, uh, by default, where the A gear use a webpack of servers, it needs to uh, to have the same drive, the same code base mounted on all the web servers. But uh, we found out that this is a performance issue because uh, uh, web servers reading a code on a mount drive gives like uh, very bad performance. So instead what we do, we exchange a gear a bit. So instead of uh, depending on uh, mountain drives, we actually are seeing the code to all the web servers. So let's, uh, let's end it here. And before we go out the door, I'll just do a, com a small uh, advertisement for um, there's, there's going to be a bird on a feather of um, on gear right after this. So um, go see that if you're interested in it. In Egea. Or you can. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, so please.